Good afternoon. We have today here with us Professor John Cleland, who is the Professor of Cardiology at the Imperial College of London and also the Royal Brompton Hospital and Glasgow. As you are all aware, he is a celebrity in formulating the guidelines of heart failure of ESC. He is the person who founded the European Journal of Heart Failure and he is on the edit editorial board of Journal of American College of Cardiology as well. And it is a proud privilege sir for us all, it is an honor for you to be here in this conference to share your knowledge, your wisdom and your experience with us which will help all clinicians, we cardiologists, physicians and also the patients at large to help them, help us treat them better and help them treat themselves better. And I welcome you here and I would like you to share your experience here with us and also to tell us your recent achievements in the field. Okay, well thank you very much for that uh, flattering uh, introduction. Uh, I, one of the things you forgot to mention is it's an opportunity to come here and meet uh, many friends. Uh, many people I trained with uh, in cardiology over the years uh, in the UK uh, have come back to India and uh, continue to practice here. And even uh, one or two British physicians uh, have actually emigrated to India and are now working over here. So not just uh, Indian trained physicians coming to the UK and c coming back again, but actually we're now going into uh, more of an exchange rather than uh, the old relationship. So that's uh, quite interesting. Um, and I think we have uh, a lot to learn from India. It's a, a huge population, a huge country. It's uh, health uh, services uh, in evolution. Uh, and it's very interesting for us to watch and see you hopefully not make some of the mistakes we made, uh, but uh, either make your own or uh, just make success. Um, in terms of uh, the work that I'm doing, I now work between uh, Imperial College in London uh, and the Royal Brompton uh, and uh, Glasgow. Glasgow is about an hour's fl flying time from uh, London. Uh, I'm the director of uh, biostatistics and clinical trials unit there. And um, so why, did I, why was I interested in that job? Well, for many of us, we work with clinical trials, but the clinical trials we get are the ones that we negotiate with the pharmaceutical or device industry. Uh, and ultimately, it is about proving uh, some concept that they need to prove for their, uh, their, their treatment. But we as doctors, uh, we should also have our clinical trials that are not done uh, to find out whether the drug works, but to find out whether the patients benefit. And those might sound the same, but they are subtly and importantly different. So in taking up this new job, it gives me the opportunity of actually um, uh, creating uh, clinical trials that are investigator led um, and we actually uh, have patients on our steering committees and the patients uh, help to design the clinical trials and run the clinical trials and make sure that they're relevant f both for patients as well as the doctors who are looking at, after the, the patients. Uh, in addition to that we're uh, having an initiative into uh, the global epidemiology of heart failure. We see registries uh, in many countries and also administrative data. Uh, it's often very difficult to compare uh, the uh, outcome of patients across different countries and we've developed quite sophisticated statistical techniques that allow us to adjust uh, for the risk across different countries so we can start to compare outcomes of patients in different healthcare systems. And that's already led to some very interesting uh, data. So we, first of all, we compared the British uh, outcome to the American outcome for hospitalized patients with heart failure. And we find if you just take the raw figures, the British patients do much worse, two to three times the inpatient mortality uh, that they have in the United States. And you might say, 
oh my gosh, that just shows how bad the NHS is and uh, it's not very good. But actually, when you take a risk score, you find that the uh, patients being admitted in America are really not that sick. They have a very low threshold to admitting the patient to hospital, which is why I think they're able to discharge so many of the patients so quickly. And when we adjust for the American risk, the risk in the British patients is exactly what the American data would have predicted. So all of this is just uh, how easy or difficult is it to get into hospital. In the UK we have very good community services so patients are usually managed at home until a certain point where it's felt that the, the home care system can no longer manage then the patient's admitted. Whereas in America it seems that admission is the first resort if a patient, uh, something goes wrong, there isn't really a great community service so they're admitted to hospital. But then we turn to our Japanese colleagues to do the same and the Japanese have an even lower risk of uh, inpatient mortality uh, than the Americans. Uh, and when we adjust for that, we do find that there's again a very low uh, admission threshold for the Japanese patients. But even accounting for that, they do much better than either the uh, Americans or the British. Now that might be because the Japanese are genetically different and which uh, the, the Japanese uh, certainly think might be true. Uh, but I wonder whether there's a simpler explanation, which is British patients, uh, they're quite friendly with the doctor and sometimes they take the advice and sometimes they don't. don't take advice. Uh, whereas Japanese patients, I think that they take it all much more seriously and when the doctor tells them to do something they do it and they do it very precisely and accurately and it may be that the reason for the better outcome of the Japanese patients is just a different cultural attitude to the uh, relationship be, with the could doctor. Could it be that uh, the so-called stable patient with heart failure mm -hmm. in, in US uh -huh. is near the targeted dosages and yours and Japanese are not near the target dosages or something like that? Well, because you, in India we find a great reluctance on the part of the patients and also on the part of the physicians to escalate doses every visit. Uh -huh. So what do you think are the, are the roadblocks in reaching the guideline based targeted doses of ACE inhibitors, beta blockers or even MRS for that matter. MRS yeah. are seriously yeah. underutilized in this part of the world as well. Yeah. So what do you think are those roadblocks? Well, uh, <clears throat> in the UK we've uh, trained a group of uh, heart failure specialist nurses and they, the doctor will give a prescription or a trial plan, uh, clinical management plan, uh, but then they give that to the nurse and the nurse then will see the patient and uh, titrate the medicines. We think we're quite good in the UK, but it is patchy that uh, some services are very good, other services struggle and uh, uh, so, um, the, but I think that there is another shift, uh, you know, so many of the patients in clinical practice are older and frailer and have reasons that they don't get into clinical trials. Uh, potentially they have more to benefit from medicine because if you're sicker, perhaps medicines make a bigger difference. Um, but their ability to tolerate these uh, large doses uh, may be different. Clinical trials have to take a very simplistic view of the world, usually, and they go for a target dose. Whereas what clinicians do, I think, is they look at the physiology and the pathophysiology of the patient. So, for instance, beta blockers. Uh, you might say, well, I titrate the beta blockers to target dose. Um, and that's what I used to do uh, and that's really what the guidelines tell you to do but it's actually no longer what I do in clinical practice. What I do in clinical practice is I titrate to achieve a beta blocker, uh, to achieve a heart rate, a uh, target heart rate. So and uh, that becomes quite interesting because you actually end up probably using on average, on average higher doses of beta blockers than you do uh, the guidelines suggest. For a patient in sinus rhythm with heart failure due to a reduced ejection fraction, 
I try and get the heart rate down between 55 and 60 beats per minute is, is, my, is my gold sweet spot uh, for sinus rhythm. For atrial fibrillation, it seems to be somewhat different. There's a very different relationship between heart rate and outcome there. And I'm very cautious now about using beta blockers uh, for in patients with atrial fibrillation. We like to control the heart rate, but the, I, my ideal heart rate for somebody uh, in atrial fibrillation and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is between 75 and 80. So that means I'm using much smaller doses of beta blockers in the atrial fibrillation patients than in the sinus rhythm patients. Now, is that the right thing to do? Um, I'm not sure that the evolution in thinking is complete. Uh, for sinus rhythm, it's pretty clear. For atrial fibrillation, as I will give a lecture this afternoon, the situation looks a bit more complex. Uh, and it may be not only the dose, but how quickly you achieve the dose. Um, what we're finding is that when you initiate a beta blocker in a patient with atrial fibrillation, there appears to be a period of risk yep. uh, that the, uh, they actually have an excess mortality from a beta blocker. Uh, and I think that may be because of too rapid uh, titration. titration. Uh, so I now go quite low and slow with uh, the beta blocker. I'm not keen to reduce heart rate too much. What we've... Um, we find, so a, a number of analyses have been done, uh, one of them suggesting that there isn't any benefit from a beta blocker in patients with atrial fibrillation, although it appears safe but not beneficial. It is the best evidence safe drug for controlling heart rate uh, in atrial fibrillation, so we sh certainly should be using beta blockers in some dose for the vast majority of patients. Um, when we look long term though, if we discount that early period of risk, it does look as though there is a large benefit long term uh, in atrial fibrillation. So we have a sort of crossover effect with an early period of risk followed by a long period of uh, benefit. So, so in, a, in, a, in a stable patient, let's say mm -hmm. a patient comes out of the ICU, uh -huh. right, and you institute, the patient is now fairly dry, uh -huh. he's not breathless, there are no lulls. You institute an ACE or a, or a beta blocker. Now here, there's always a dilemma. Should I uptitrate beta blocker first or uptitrate ACE inhibitor first? That's the first question. Yeah. And when to add a mineralocortical receptor antagonist? Okay. Provided potassium permits, of course. Yeah. So in these circumstances, uh, a, a patient who has had a recent decompensation, we would be unhappy if the patient didn't go home on a combination of uh, uh, I'm going to say an ACE inhibitor for convenience at the moment, uh, ACE inhibitor, MRA and a beta blocker. Okay. So this is assuming their heart rate, uh, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Um, uh, I titrate the ACE inhibitor quickly, assuming the blood pressure and renal function are okay. Yep. The uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, I uh, put them on 25 milligrams and basically we won't be moving the dose of that uh, unless the potassium goes too high or the potassium is low and we need to get the potassium up. And again, we talked a little bit about heart rate, so we should also talk about potassium. The ideal potassium uh, is uh, 4.5 and it should be between 4 and 4.9. So, uh, and again, you can titrate the MRA to try and achieve this uh, optimal uh, potassium. The beta blockers I titrate much more slowly. Uh, it does depend a little bit on heart rate. If I've got somebody like your patient who now looks dry and comfortable, uh, but they still have their in sinus rhythm at 100 beats per minute, uh, you know, I would be tempted to titrate the beta blocker a little bit more quickly. If the heart rate is already down at 70 beats per minute, then, then I can why wait. Why does and, it go uh, then I can go a little bit more slowly. Yeah. So I think you know you're uh, titrating these drugs to physiological targets. To me, makes more sense than just going for a dose. Sure. Dose gives you a rough idea of uh, where you're going, but the uh, the heart rate and the potassium will tell you much more precisely what dose you need. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, that yeah. was a very good advice. Yeah.
Uh, now, the next question is, we I should, got Arnie. I should, I should just say, well, Arnie, are you going to come to Arnie? Yeah. Yep, go on. Yeah. We have, we have been introduced to Arnie recently in this country. And the biggest question now we have, we have a decent amount of experience with this drug. Uh, what is your opinion about Arnie use in ACE 9 patients? Yeah. So... Uh, and how early, how early after the patient comes out of the ICU? Mm -hmm. could, you, could you start Arnie straight up ahead of ACE inhibitors? Yeah. So, uh, well, j just recently uh, a, a study was presented at the American Heart Association, the Pioneer HF, HF. study. And uh, in that study, 35% uh, of patients had new onset heart failure. Yeah. So they'd never been treated for heart failure before. 65% uh, had, uh, had a previous uh, history of heart failure. I can't remember exactly, but I think um, only about half of the patients had been treated with, uh, I think it was only 40% had been treated with an ACE inhibitor, maybe 20% with an ARB uh, prior to that admission. And the uh, randomized patients to initiation of uh, um, uh, ARNI or um, enalapril uh, and uh, basically showed that with, within eight weeks, which was the primary endpoint in this study, and it was a mechanistic study, so it was looking at natriuretic peptides, but in addition they looked at uh, serious adverse events. And if you look at the composite serious adverse events, uh, they were significantly more with the enalapril group than the ARNI group. Uh, so the patients with the ARNIs were uh, there were fewer deaths, not many deaths in the study. I think it was uh, 10 versus 5. Uh, there were uh, fewer uh, rehospitalizations uh, and generally seemed to be better outcomes. So I think the Pioneer study gives us the first hint that uh, going straight to an RNA is the it first It gives us some, some confidence. Uh, yeah. But would you, wait, would you wait maybe for three days or at least four days till the hemodynamic stabilizes or uh, Let's say the patient has just come off the ICU. Yeah. And uh, h what is the earliest window you can think of? Yeah. Um, so I think our, you know, we're gaining experience in this area as well. And um, so if a patient has good renal function, the blood pressure is okay, then I would have no problem about starting them straight away on an ARNI. If the patient has uh, problems with uh, major renal dysfunction, hypotension, then I'm inclined to uh, think about either an ACE or an ARB to begin with. Uh, why do I say even mention an angiotensin receptor blocker? The answer is, well, if I want to switch straight from one drug to the other, an angiotensin it receptor blocker, I can just do a straight switch. If I have to switch from an ACE inhibitor, then I need to wait 36, 48 hours between dosing and that's sort of a bit messy in this situation. So <clears throat> still a little bit cautious uh, in a very unstable, delicate patient, I might want to go in with an ACE or an ARB first, stabilize the situation along with the beta blocker and the MRA. Uh, and you want the patient's a little bit more stable and I'm comfortable that I know how much trouble they've run into with uh, low blood pressure and renal dysfunction on the ACE or an ARB then you can think about think of, uh, switching uh, to the ARNI. But for a patient who is uh, more straightforward, then uh, providing you, you've got the reimbursement and everything else seems uh, smart to go down that route. When it comes to outpatients, uh, I, I must admit that we go more along the European guidelines rather than the American guidelines. Uh, we have many patients who come back to our clinic and we measure the NT pro BNP and it's only mildly elevated uh, NT pro BNP of 200, 250 nanograms per liter. We've looked at those patients in our clinic. The uh, likelihood that those patients are going to have an event in the next five years is really low. They do very well. They have responded to treatment and if you've responded to treatment why do you need to change? So, at least in our setting, it's much uh, less expensive to measure NT pro BNP than to start the Entresto. Uh, but, um, you know, also we find with patients that uh, a patient comes in and says, I feel fine. 
and you measure the NT pro BMP and it's maybe a thousand. And you think, well, the patient isn't fine. Uh, when you have the conversation with the patient, you, you've got something to back you up and say, well, you may feel fine. You may say you don't want to change, but I can see in your tests that the yeah. disease is not controlled and you should have something more. Yeah. But probably, it, is it not true that uh, anti-pro BNP in a stable patient, so-called, anti-pro BNP would give a guide that you still need up titration of the therapy? Yes. If I'm saying that, yeah. am I correct? The, the, yeah, the, that patient has a continuing substantial, substantial risk, risk. Uh, and uh, that, that, will, that I think will be modified yeah. Yeah. by the RNA, not maybe, but will be. Yeah, one more question is that stable patients with heart failure, in vitro class 2 and 3, mm -hmm. as we know from the literature that uh, they die more of sudden cardiac death mm -hmm. than heart failure. Now, in my country, we can't subject all of them to assess for the risk of sudden cardiac death. Mm -hmm. So those who come in class 2 and class 3, which of them I should evaluate mm -hmm. for the risk of sudden cardiac death? Yeah. So I think that the defibrillator is optimally used uh, in a well patient with a bad ventricle. Yeah. So when you see that auditing, uh, when you see a, a patient who's looking really well, but the ventricle looks horrible, those are the patients that uh, I think benefit mostly from an ICD. Yeah. In the SCUDHEF study, which I think is the best of these studies, if you were an NYHA class three or worse, there was no benefit from a yeah, defibrillator. Yeah. Uh, those patients, I think the heart failure has gone too far. And we've seen this in this other clinical trials in revascularization. If you look at revascularization, if you look at uh, uh, statins, if you look at uh, the recent Commander HF study with rivaroxaban, in each of those uh, situations, in the milder patients, NYHI class 2 patients, there seems to be a benefit, but in NYHA class 3, 4, the sicker patients, you lose the benefit. So I think it's the same with uh, defibrillators. Um, if we look at the bundle of evidence, uh, then uh, an ICD also works better in people who have an ejection fraction less than 30%. So if you're in class 2 with an ejection fraction less than 30%, you really should be thinking about a defibrillator. Does um, your, uh, by any chance, soluble ST2 gives you some idea about the prognosis and the risk of sudden cardiac death? I've read because the, even army I've read reduced. The, yeah, I've read the papers. I don't have any personal experience of that, right. but uh, I think it uh, is fascinating. Uh, yeah. You know, I think, uh, yeah. You, you, you don't recommend that? Well, we don't use it, so yeah. uh, uh, if we haven't used it, uh, and I don't think the evidence from the literature is all that compelling. Yep. I think it's an interesting story and may be true. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, you know, yeah. tr try and uh, stimulate some research yeah. that will convince us all. Thank you. And one last question. Many physicians in this country, to get to the target dose of ARNI, mm -hmm. you know, down titrate the beta blockers mm -hmm. or shift from carvedilol to bisoprolol or stop the beta blocker all of all together and shift to urobradin uh -huh. to get the margin of blood pressure so that you can uptight it the uh -huh. now is this wise thing to do i have my own reservations about that uh, is this a wise thing to withdraw beta blocker to get to the target dose of arni no i think that's a very bad idea uh, first of all uh, we've got growing evidence uh, from the arni trials uh, yes. that even if you don't uh, achieve the target RNA dose, uh, there does still seem to be a benefit. So if the patient can't do that, then don't back off the other treatment. With some caveats, uh, you have know, said already about atrial fibrillation, yes. that I think it is okay to back off on the dose of the beta blocker and allow the heart rate to rise a little bit. Um, uh, for the MRE, uh, I think that you can optimize the dose of the MRE to fit the potassium, try and get the potassium as close to 4.5 as possible. But the big class of drugs that you could think about is, especially in an NYHA class 2 patient, a relatively mild patient, are the diuretics. And, uh, 
So trying to. So that that we always yeah, down tight. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So, if you so that's, down, that's very nice to hear from you. Thank you. Yeah. And one last question now. Do you think heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, HEPF, and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, HEPREF, are the continuum of the same disease process? Or there are two different entities with two different disease processes? I think that they are predominantly two di different disease processes. Okay. It doesn't mean, say, that some people can't have both. Yep. Uh, so, you know, you could have a hypertensive heart disease uh, with HEPF, and then they have a myocardial infarction, and they, they then have a mixture of HEPF and HEPREF. Uh, so I think we get these mixed populations, but I think by and large, yes, they are. And I think the easiest way to think about it is with the HEPF, you're thinking about hypertension and maybe amyloid now these days. Yep. Uh, so thinking down that route, uh, these patients often have CKD, atrial fibrillation, uh, and, and uh, history of hypertension. Whereas the HEF-REF group tend to be more dilated cardiomyopathy, ischemic heart disease. You know, some of them, yes, they are hypertensive. And I think cardiac MR has made a lot of difference in our understanding of the underlying disease process in HEP-PEP yeah. patients. So many of HEP-PEPs you have now been able to diagnose as sarcoid, Mm -hmm. or amyloid, mm -hmm. which we were completely yeah. missing in the, in the past. So I think yes, I think that's right. And of course, there wasn't really a reason to get terribly excited about diagnosing amyloid because it was a bit of a death sentence. Yes, yes. Uh, but now uh, we have a drug, albeit far too expensive, even for the US or UK healthcare system, a tefamidus. Uh, but hopefully the costs will come down. And uh, this is an extremely effective uh, treatment for one form of amyloidosis, uh, the uh, transtheretin uh, amyloid. Thank you very much, uh, yeah. John. Uh, it was wonderful to Pleasure. be having with you. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank Lovely you. to be in India. Thank you.